of efficient innovation. What can be learned from China's planned capitalism? Doug Guthrie, George Washington University. In fall of 89, I was living in Taiwan, studying Mandarin Chinese. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank you all for having me here. It's uh, wonderful to get to talk to, uh, amongst such, so many interesting people about these issues. We're going to go from the micro level up to the macroeconomic level. Uh, but one of the things that joins what, uh, the, what was just discussed and what I'm doing is really trying to think through what issues drive innovation. Now, about a week ago or two weeks ago, I guess I was at a forum in which the Carlos Slim, um, uh, the world's richest businessman, or I guess the richest man in the world right now, was talking about issues that he wanted to discuss that have to do with innovation and how the world can solve its problems. And of course, he relied fundamentally on the privatization model. His notion was that if you want to understand innovation, you have to think about privatization and let get governments out of the way. Now, as somebody who's been studying the economic reforms in China over the last two decades, I never really believed that. Um, but that issue height was heightened for me uh, in the recent economic crisis. So the, I want to talk about two walls today. One is first a mental wall, one that we particularly have in the United States, which is an obsession with the idea that markets can solve all of our social problems and that they will fundamentally solve those problems better than governments do. The real mental problem here is not, I wouldn't argue, that markets can't solve them better. It's that we as people don't have the political will to actually live in a market world. The problem is, when you have a situation in which you give people the incentives or you deregulate and allow them to take massive risks, but you're not willing to let markets discipline that risky behavior, the whole system falls apart. So if we don't live in a world in which we have the political will to, uh, to engage, to allow markets to truly discipline behavior, which meant in the case of the most recent crisis, we had to have let all of the banks fail, uh, then we simply don't have any business talking about the beauty and the, uh, and the elegance of a free market system. So that kind of takes us to another question. Now, what I really want to talk about today, though, is what I've learned from China over the last couple of decades. This is an economic story that we know well. A backwater, third world developing nation on the brink of bankruptcy in 1979 uh, emerges to become the second largest economy in the world. Uh, and truly an economic powerhouse. Now, the interesting thing about that economic power right now, though, is it's often thought of as just being the factory for the world. There's nothing really going on in terms of true innovation there. We just know that they got there because of deep, cheap labor. Okay? But what we're really talking about is this, this, so, this uh, scientific, this uh, futuristic, uh, science fiction-esque landscape that has just emerged out of nothing uh, to become this grand economic system. Now, this economic system penetrates right down to the market levels. Um, and there are many images with which we might tackle China or what we, might, we might understand what's going on there. Okay? You could think about it as red China and the rise of a guerrilla warrior who led China to freedom. Uh, you could think about China's m m coming together with the West. But the real moment that I like to begin talking about is when Deng Xiaoping won his position in the party, uh, he got on a plane, came over to the United States, donned a cowboy hat, met with Jimmy Carter, went to a John Denver concert, and then visited three cities that really marked what was going to happen over the course of the next set of 20 years. First, he went to Seattle. He wanted to see what a high-tech economy like Boeing took, not a high-tech in the classical sense, but a very technologically adept economy. He wanted to also see what a consumer-based system looked like with Coca-Cola, and he wanted to see what NASA was up to. Now, the real moment, though, that the world fundamentally changed and China made the transition or crossed the threshold from being a big economy with a deep, cheap labor pool to truly being a dramatic, innovative economy uh, happened in this moment, uh, which was September 18, 2001. Not many people remember that moment because uh, we had other things on our mind at that time, but this was the moment of China's accession to the WTO. And of course, who could forget in 2008 the greatest coming out party the world had ever seen. Now, what I want to do, though, is I also want to acknowledge or think about why China sort of gets so little credit for what's actually going on. Uh, there's a whole phenomenon or cottage industry that I like to think of as the doom and gloom industry of China. Every year, there's a new person on the horizon to talk about why this whole system is going to fall apart. The pollution is terrible and endemic. The trade imbalances are horrible. 
and of course the political system we all know very well from the images that we've seen. Now what I really want to talk about today in my, the, the re remainder of my time is how innovative an economy can, that, like this can be. Is China just a deep, cheap labor pool, and is it winning in the economic system because of that cheap labor? Or is there actual innovation that's going on here, and what can we learn about it? The interesting thing here is that China, at least with respect to the United States especially, it's, Europe is doing better than the United States, but China is completely dominating the space of renewable energy. Uh, and how that actually happens, I think, is a key to the, what the lessons can be learned here. Uh, it's even so extreme right now that the United States, the United Steel Workers, are filing a, a claim in the World Trade Organization against China's unfair practices for state subsidies, which I think is kind of humorous because state subsidies aren't necessarily an unfair practice. They're just good business. Now, what, what do we do in places like the United States when we want to see renewable energy come? We usually use symbolic acts and a bully pulpit, and then we wait for venture capital to come in from the sidelines. So we get a lot of good press. Now, what does China do? China doesn't wait for venture capital to come in from the sidelines because venture capital has a fundamental problem for long-term industries. Venture capitalists typically want to see exit strategies within about seven years. Now, when you have an energy like renewable energy, an industry like renewable energy, uh, you're not going to have exit strategies coming in seven years. And so you have to have a motor that really invests aggressively in that system. You cannot allow the market mechanism to, to drive this process forward. You have to have states get involved. So China, while we were uh, wondering whether or not we should get into this industry and, and setting up some symbolic acts and some state subsidies through tax credits, China was aggressing whole hog. Uh, investing whole hog in this energy. One of the most famous companies in this area is Ingley Green Energy Holding Company. Uh, it is a subsidiary of an organization called the State-Owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission in China, which is in many ways still a fundamental body of the state, but is one of the most dynamic capitalist investors, one of the most dynamic asset companies in the world. Uh, I thought there was a particularly interesting moment, and I had to put this on here because I think that's Germany, right? Uh, in the most recent World Cup, but the, the interesting thing to me is really what those signs behind say about the different economies. In the United States, we have McDonald's to, to sell to the world. China is busy using Ingli Solar, uh, and we're losing that game. Now, very quickly, I want to talk about a couple of different uh, ways to think about how these economic reforms have come forward. And I'm going to focus on three key things that are fundamental here. Uh, and I think unpacking the economic reforms actually allows us to understand something uh, that we've missed or is often missed in terms of thinking about how China's reforms have gone forward. Gradualism, decentralization, and an openness to foreign investment. First, gradualism. China is the one planned economy that wholeheartedly rejected the notion that you could have a rapid transition to private property. Now, a lot of the world looked at this and just thought, well, China is just being recalcitrant because there are a set of authoritarian oligarchs who just want to hold on to power, which may be true, except this approach to reform has actually been incredibly innovative because the a process of building institutions is completely the opposite in China than in places like the United States. In the United States, we agree on an economic model, impose it from above and say this is what it's going to be. In China, on the other hand, these institutions grow from the grassroots up. So to give you an example, in 1994, there was a lot of hand-wringing because China hadn't passed a labor law. Everybody was wondering where it is, why is it taking so long? What most people didn't know is that China was experimenting with labor contracts since 1983 in order to build up the knowledge of how this institutional structure or this institutional system should be, so that by the time they pass a labor law, it is actually one that really makes sense for how the economy works. The second piece of the puzzle that's really important for understanding China's economic reforms is decentralization. This is the key. This is the model of how economic development happens in China. China did not privatize, but it localized. And so you created an entire decentralized system of entrepreneurial local officials who were very aggressively competing with each other to drive forward a capitalist process. Uh, one thing that's a side note here, and it's important to, to know about China, the most important thing going on to China is not happening in Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou. That's the typical place where everybody's looking, but that's old news. The, the real news is the second-tier city phenomenon. Places like Chengdu, Xi'an, Suzhou, 
Dalian, these places are so interesting in terms of what's going on, and it's all because they have entrepreneurial local governments and are very nimble and fast. I'll tell you a quick story about how this goes. If you've seen the transformation of Pudong in Shanghai, for those of you who've been there, you should go 100 miles inland and see the transformation of the Suzhou Industrial Park. This is one of the most amazing economic stories you will ever see. Suzhou was having problems competing with Shanghai because Shanghai was actually really shutting it out in terms of development. Uh, so they got together with the Singaporean government, built a, an industrial park that brought in $9 billion from Singapore and very quickly became the number one destination of foreign direct investment in all of China. It is a truly rema remarkable and miraculous system, and it's truly because of the entrepreneurial nature of the local investment. I also mentioned a few minutes ago the State-Owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission. This is a state body, of course. This is not a private system, right? So a lot of people who are co-investing like Warren Buffett think, well, this must be some form of privatization because we know, because of the economic ideology about this, that markets are better and privatization is better and if PetroChina is becoming the most efficient energy company in the world, which it is by almost every statistic in terms of, in terms of efficiency, uh, then it must be a privatized system. It's not. This is a state system, but it is a dynamic capitalist investor so here's really where we get to the interesting point of China. How is it today that the largest communist society in the world is the most dynamic capitalist economy in the world? That really is the interesting question of our time. Now, there's also a key part of this that is about attracting foreign direct investment. This is the holy grail for what these local officials want. They attract players. They do interesting deals with them. Those that are less corrupt are actually winning this game, so we often hear about the corruption that's endemic in China. The reality is that places like Suzhou and Chengdu are winning the fight for foreign direct investment precisely because they are so nimble, so good, and so, and, and so uh, uncorrupt. Key example of the case of Chengdu, uh, Intel used to have its entire operation operating out of Shanghai until about three years ago when they decided we need to move west, Chongqing thought it was going to win that dynamic and had and labeled itself a provincial-level municipality in a way of getting that kind of business. Uh, but it was Chengdu that got it because of this nimble, driven, entrepreneurial local state that actually drove that process. Uh, similarly, of course, bigger organizations like Walmart are all over China, and they're really driving, of course, an amazing uh, set of in, uh, investment opportunities and really, in many ways, creating a very dynamic kind of capitalist sector that's really about an allegiance between the local states and the, the foreign investors. Now, I just want to wrap up very quickly here before I, uh, before I get uh, the, the hook. Um, in the capitalist West, I think we should drop the silly allegiance around the beauty of the free market. We don't have the political will to live by it, and it fails in terms of innovation. I think we have a tremendous amount to learn from China, and I'll just give you four key points on that. China's not just a place of radical institutional change because of the material changes that have gone there. It is a place that is actually remaking how we think about the evolution of markets. It is a place where radical institutional change is happening through experimentation. It's been successful largely because of government intervention, and I use that word intervention uh, ironically, because actually it's been primarily because of the government's will to actually drive this process forward. It is not a story of cheap labor. It's actually a story of true uh, state-led innovation. And there's one ironic kicker here, which is that China may in the end actually be more transparent even, say, than the United States. I would say this is less so the case with Europe. Uh, but we think we always have them beat uh, on the transparency front because, of course, capitalist institutions are much more uh, transparent than state-led ones. But the corporate lobby that is distorting markets fundamentally in the country that I come from, which is also ironically, I think, a broken democracy, um, I think is ultimately probably not nearly as transparent as what's actually going on in China. Uh, so that's all I have for you today, and um, thank you. <laughs>